look, the, the true uh, location and disposition of central bank gold reserves are secrets far more sensitive than the true location and disposition of nuclear weapons, because nuclear weapons can only destroy the world. But with enough gold, you can control the world. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, the host for this conversation. Really looking forward to it. We're bringing back a guest that we only have one on once a year usually because we catch up in New Orleans at the New Orleans Investment Conference. But we decided let's let's break that uh, uh, let's break that tradition. Let's let's bring him on more often and catch up what is happening on uh, with within the gold space. It's a uh, Chris Powell. He's the secretary and treasurer over at GATA. That's the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. And we're really looking forward to, to discussing with him the price in, in or the price move in gold. Uh, maybe some of the background there, uh, central bank buying, but also selling. We're going to dive it a bit into the nitty gritty of the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS. Uh, there's been some news that Saudi Arabia joined the BIS program. Curious to figure out, like, and I'm still trying to piece it together. How does Saudi Arabia fit into all of this as well? Could could be interesting. And uh, do we believe what China just announced on la last Friday that they haven't bought any gold uh, in, in in May? So we're gonna take a deep dive here and I'm looking forward to bringing on Chris Powell but before I do that you know the spiel if you've been a regular uh, viewer of this program hit that like and subscribe button because about 75 to 80 percent of you watching are not subscribed help us change that it helps us out tremendously do it as a favor we appreciate it thank you now without further ado Chris it is good to see you again thank you so much for joining me here on SOAR Financially no oh, it's great to be with you again Kai yeah, looking forward to the discussion, and we just had a chance to chat off off camera here as well. And there is quite a bit to discuss. And maybe we'll start with an opening question here. How surprised were you that gold was able to run up to over twenty four hundred dollars? Uh, well, you know, it, we we know the day is coming. Uh, the question really is whether we're going to live long enough to see the the day of liberation of the uh, the monetary metals markets. Uh, uh, you know, s certainly. The rise to twenty-four hundred dollars uh, would not have happened uh, if the banks, central banks, and the governments that have been keeping their uh, their foot on the gold uh, price uh, uh, wanted it, didn't want it to happen. Uh, I think uh, it's now acknowledged that you've got eastern central banks competing against western central banks in in the gold market. Uh, that the gold price is being set increasingly in the east in Asia where there's real physical demand from official sources. Um, this is not what uh, I think the United States uh, and the Bank of England uh, would have would have allowed to happen if they could have controlled it. I think uh, I think certainly the uh, the BAS gold swap figures uh, that got announced the other day suggest that somebody is still trying to uh, uh, keep their foot on gold. Now, interesting. Appreciate that introduction there, Chris. And uh, l l let's start there. L let's talk about that impact of the twenty four hundred dollar gold price. You said the U.S., the U.K. is suppressing it. Um, I mentioned to you before hitting the record button, going over two thousand dollars per ounce of gold was always seen as utopian because that would mean turmoil. Quite honestly, like in the financial markets, we're not really seeing turmoil yet. Like, what what is the impact? And uh, maybe that's the deeper reason why the gold price has been suppressed. But like. What, why, why, why don't we see that yet? Well, I, I think f from the first place, uh, there's not an awful lot of attention in the, uh, uh, the retail uh, financial markets to, uh, to the gold price. Uh, uh, other prices are seeming normal. The uh, U.S. stock market is, well, it seems to be declining. It uh, certainly hasn't, hasn't crashed. Uh, maybe uh, the retail market in gold is not going to get very interested until there is something like a... Uh, like a crash, but uh, governments governments don't want a rising gold price generally. Now, uh, with uh, the war in Ukraine going on and U.S. Uh, government sanctions going uh, up against everybody, there's a split in the ranks of central banks. Central banks realize that uh, if they continue to let the dollar be their reserve currency, they will always be under the foreign policy and uh, military thumb of the United States. So there's a there's a big split in the rank of central banks. Uh, those that uh, want uh, some some kind of independence from uh, from the U.S. realize that 
that, that gold as a reserve currency is the only practical option for them. And that that's where we're going. That's where it seems like, because it's only the East buying gold right now, it seems, uh, looking at the buying reports. Maybe Poland, Ireland are the only other two countries that I've seen from the West, um, or that I would sort of attribute to the West. Well, Tur uh, Turkey, Turkey has been buying. Uh, you know, Turkey's got a foot in both, both camps, I suppose. Uh, the question is like has there been an official memo for example i think we talked about that in new orleans as well has there been an official memo by by the fed for example or the the u.s government saying you can't buy gold it make it'll make us look weak well no but uh there are indications i mean the gold researcher jan neewenhaus who uh, writes for gainesville coins in florida has been pointing out the uh, central banks that have what they call gold revaluation accounts and even uh, acknowledge that the accounts can be used to revalue gold upward and uh, devalue currencies uh, downward and uh, to uh, reliquify central banks that have a debt problem. Uh, these things are turning up more often, indicating that central banks realize that the uh, uh, traditional purposes of gold in include being revalued upward to reliquify the governments that have gold reserves. In fact, the uh, economists, uh, Paul, Paul Brodsky and Lee Quaintance wrote a paper, I think back in 2012, uh, arguing that uh, preparations for a revaluation of gold were already thoroughly underway in the central bank uh, community in order to devalue debt, devalue currencies and, and reliquify governments. Uh, I, I see more and more evidence suggesting that Brod Brodsky and Quaintance were, were correct. Uh, but I still don't think the United States is ready for that to, uh, to happen yet. Somebody is uh, doing a lot of gold swaps through the Bank for International Settlements in, in Basel, Switzerland. And, and these swaps almost certainly are used for gold price suppression to move gold supplies around from various uh, bullion banks and central banks into the markets where uh, uh, some tamping down of the gold price is believed, uh, is believed necessary. And as our consultant, Bob Lamborn, who's the only guy in the world who studies this, as far as I can see, uh, reported last week uh, the uh, BIS gold swaps, which were heading down towards zero uh, last year, uh, they rose 40% in May from uh, uh, 78 tons to 109 tons. Um, no central bank would be swapping gold unless they they wanted to intervene surreptitiously in the gold in the gold market to uh, to tamp the price down and that that activity went up in may according to uh, the bis's statement of account which is on our internet site very interesting like um, I, I, <laughs> sorry um under our last video, Chris, we, we got one comment, and uh, that comment was a clearer definition of swaps and what it, what a swap actually is would have been, would have been welcomed, and how this paper trade works. I think now is a good point uh, now a good point in time to to do clarify that a little bit before we dive deeper it, in, into a, the market fundamentals. It's so. a mechanism, uh, you know, by which a uh, at least when it's done through the BIS, uh, a a central bank arranges with a bullion bank or another central bank to uh, exchange uh, nominal possession of, uh, of gold, uh, to uh, move it into an account at the, uh, at the BIS where other parties in the swap can, can draw against it. Uh, the swap can be reversed uh, in, in the future and the nominal uh, ownership uh, returned to uh, uh, the person who, who lent it. But it's, it's, it's basically, I think, a, a mechanism of, of, of gold lending and gold accounting that uh, is under the control of uh, central banks, members of the BIS, uh, that they can use to uh, uh, adjust the gold price with. Um, there's, no, there's no need for, for these swaps and, unless you want to intervene surreptitiously in the gold market in, in order to suppress the price. No, I appreciate that clarification. Now, the question that arose, of course, is uh, the the People's Bank of China just announced last Friday that they haven't bought any gold in uh, in May. You're you're mentioning the swaps are up, so somebody is selling gold, and and yet the gold price is up by, by about forty dollars. Nothing nothing too crazy, but about what is that five percent maybe um, for well, for the month well, of May. Well, we, we had we had a big uh, big crash the other day, and now the supposed weakness in the gold price is being attributed to the announcement by the People's Bank of China that they didn't buy any gold last month and that 
uh, is the report saying, well, China has paused its gold buying. Uh, that is a supposition up, up to the point of the ridiculous. Uh, unless you're on the inside in China, you don't know what they're, they're doing. Uh, for all you know, uh, China could announce a one-month suspension of its, of its gold buying simply to uh, discourage the market, to uh, knock the price down a bit so that China and other central banks can uh, get, it, get more of it at a cheaper price. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of disinformation, uh, a lot of head fakes in the, in the gold market. Um, Jim Rickards and uh, James Turk and, and, and other gold analysts uh, have said for many years that China does not report to the IMF all its gold reserves, that it has is holding gold at state banks and uh, with the military, and not all of these reserves get reported by the People's Bank of China to the International Monetary Fund and the World Gold Council, uh, that uh, China has a lot more gold than it reports. I don't, I don't think a, a one-month suspension of People's Bank of China gold purchases means, means a damn thing. I go back to, I think it was 15 years ago, the Saudi Arabia Monetary Authority uh, one day uh, reported what seemed to be a, a huge increase in its gold reserves. And uh, that was a bit of a sensation in the market. And finally, I think a reporter from, from Reuters got a hold of Mohammed El Jasser, who was then the head of the Saudi Arabia Monetary Authority, and, and asked him about this big increase in Saudi gold reserves. And the central bank president said, oh, no, there, there wasn't really any big uh, increase in our uh, gold reserves. We just had this gold in other accounts and they were consolidating it in their report. Uh, you can go back uh, even farther than that. There was uh, a couple of years when the People's Bank of China didn't report any gold acquisitions at all. And then I think they reported uh, in one fell swoop something like 1,500 uh, new tons that they supposedly had acquired just recently. Well, they didn't acquire 1,500 tons just recently. They had it somewhere else and they weren't reporting it. So central bank uh, reports of gold possession uh, have to be looked at very critically. Yeah, no, I, I agree there. And of course, uh, you know, shenanigans can be can be played um, thinking about central bank currencies, because that's that's the big, for lack of a better term, theory behind, behind uh, maybe Chinese buying as well and uh, getting or maybe repatriating some of those funds they've invested into U.S. treasuries, because that has been going down as well. So I'm curious, yeah, you, you do, do you see a correlation about... there? Well, if you want to talk about repatriation, I mean, U.S. Representative Alex Mooney followed up, uh, got his question to uh, uh, the Federal Reserve a few months ago. He asked the uh, Fed Chairman, Jerome Powell, uh, uh, have there been repatriations of uh, foreign uh, central bank custodial gold at the uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of, of New York in, in recent months? Uh, Powell was pressed about this, I guess, a second time. And he finally acknowledged Mooney's in inquiry, but he didn't answer the question. Have central banks been repatriating gold from the New York Fed? The Fed will not, uh, will not answer the question. What does that tell you? It tells you something is happening that is uh, very sensitive and the public must not be allowed to, uh, to know about it. The, uh, look, the, the true uh, location and disposition of central bank gold reserves are secrets far more sensitive than the true location and disposition of nuclear weapons, because nuclear weapons can only destroy the world. But with enough gold, you can control the world. You can control the world by uh, controlling the value of all uh, uh, capital, labor, goods, and services in the world, and the control the value of all currencies, because the value of currencies is the reciprocal of the gold price. Uh, so possession of gold, its true location, disposition, what's being done with it, is is probably the most sensitive national security secret in the world. It is definitely an interesting topic here because uh, talking about that, it, it, like independence is a big one because we've seen the U.S. sort of uh, weaponize the monetary system, meaning the SWIFT system. And now we see all the banks in the East, China, you know, sort of getting out of U.S. Treasury bonds and foreign holdings. They're not fleeing the U.S. Like I think that's an exaggeration on some parts, but they haven't been buying new Treasury bonds. They've been selling down. I think they almost half their position, if I'm not mistaken, and and now building up those reserves uh, just to be independent and outside that money system. Is that is that a correct statement? Yeah, the, the the central banks around the world, seeing what the United States has has done to to Russia during the war with the Ukraine, and 
seeing how the United States is putting these economic sanctions on everybody that uh, does not uh, comply with U.S. foreign policy, they realize that, hey, our, our independence, our freedom of action uh, depends on our uh, reducing our position in the dollar and, and U.S. government uh, treasuries. Now, uh, you know, they're waking up. Uh, you know, GATA has been trying to wake up the retail market in, uh, in, in the West and around the world for a long time to this very point. I don't think we've had much success, but I think we have had success with, uh, with other central banks. I'm very confident that GATA's work uh, had a big influence on uh, uh, the Russian policy with gold, the Chinese policy with gold, and the policy uh, that other central banks have had with gold. We've had some consultations with uh, central banks over the years. Uh, uh, in fact, I think it was back in 2006, 2005, the, the uh, deputy chairman of the Bank of Russia, Oleg Mazeskov, gave a speech uh, at the London Bullion Market Association summer conference in Moscow in which the, the only words in English he spoke were gold antitrust action committee. Uh, and that struck us as a, you know, particularly remarkable because to the best of our knowledge at that time, we'd had no contact with anybody in Russia whatsoever. I had some correspondence with Mazeskov after that, and uh, he was gracious enough to give me a, uh, an English translation of his speech, and that's on our uh, internet site. Now, he, he didn't exactly say that Gata is perfectly right about the manipulation of the gold market, but he, uh, he made remarks, uh, I think he said something to the effect that uh, uh, the gold market was kind of enigmatic and didn't always uh, seem to be following the ordinary laws of supply and demand. And he mentioned uh, Gata in that context. So I think he was, he was letting the London Bullion Banks know that, that Russia now was fully aware of uh, how Western governments were, were trying to manipulate the gold market in order to support Western currencies and to exploit commodity uh, exporting countries like Russia. Well, Chris, since I have you, it's like it's not only just the, the the central banks that are manipulating the gold price. We've seen J.P. Morgan and other banks being, you know, sentenced and uh, being being fined for for spoofing and meaning manipulating the prices of gold and silver. And uh, to follow up on that, like Basel III keeps popping up when I look at gold market manipulation and especially of un unallocated gold ounces, meaning creating paper gold. Uh, that is not backed by anything because it's just a paper, like a derivative that's being traded. Um, Basel III was introduced earlier this year here in 2024. Uh, those are new banking regulations. Like how big of an impact is that new, re uh, are those new regulations? And uh, forgive me, I'm not an expert on Basel III, so I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Do you see a bit of a, what do you slow down maybe an ETF issuance, ETF activity um, in, in that regard? Well, uh, the uh, Basel III regulations have been construed to prevent uh, bullion banks in London and elsewhere from uh, issuing more uh, gold derivatives than they have real metal to back them up. That's a sea change in, in the gold market. Um, that, I think, pretty much has been knocking the London bullion banks and other bullion banks uh, out of the gold derivative business uh, and definitely reducing the amount of paper gold floating around in the world. Uh, and the uh, uh, implementation of Basel III seems to have correlated fairly closely with the rise in the gold price uh, above uh, $2,000 an ounce. So I'm inclined to think that the, the regulations uh, really have had a very big impact on, uh, on the gold market. But um, there are ways of getting gold derivatives into the market uh, without using bullion banks, without getting the bullion banks to have to extend their own credit uh, behind uh, the gold derivatives. And uh, gold swaps through the through the BIS uh, is one way. I, I think uh, uh, governments could open their or, or run accounts through uh, through through other uh, uh, banking institutions and get derivatives into the market uh, that way. In fact, I. I, I think that uh, you know much of the gold trading and the silver trading that uh, gets attributed uh, to uh, uh, big banks like J.P. Morgan Chase and HSBC uh, and Citibank. I, I'm morally convinced that that's really government trading. It's just the government uh, going uh, through uh, intermediaries to intervene in the in the market. If you look closely at Bloomberg's coverage of uh, 
one of the spoofing trials uh, in uh, in New York, uh, buried at the bottom of one of its reports uh, was that uh, evidence introduced in the spoofing trial showed that J.P. Morgan uh, long had been trading gold directly for central banks. Uh, there was an interview that I think two interviews uh, that uh, Jamie Jamie Dimon did, and uh, then Blythe Masters, who was then running uh, uh, J.P. Morgan's uh, commodity desk at the time, uh, saying that oh they had they had no position, the bank had no proprietary position uh, in the silver market, that it just was trading silver for clients. Uh, journalism being so mediocre, financial journalism being so mediocre, nobody followed up by asking either of them, well, who are these clients? Is J.P. Morgan trading silver for, uh, for the U.S. government or other governments? Never got asked. But if you read one of those uh, Bloomberg stories about the spoofing trial of the Morgan executives in New York, you find that there was evidence introduced that uh, J.P. Morgan Chase Long was trading gold directly for a number of central banks. So I argue that the bullion banks uh, have been acting as intermediaries for government trading. And uh, I think that's been happening in the silver market. I can't prove that, but I can show you the story saying that uh, Morgan was trading gold directly uh, for, for governments. And that came out in, in, the, spoofing, uh, in the spoofing case. Uh, uh, so all these, uh, all these complaints that people make uh, about bullion banks manipulating the price, uh, I think they're missing the point. Bullion banks aren't doing it. It's the government doing it through bullion banks. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the Gold Reserve Act of 1934 uh, explicitly gives the, uh, the U.S. Treasury Department the, uh, the power to uh, intervene surreptitiously, uh, not just in, in U.S. markets, but in any market in the world. You go to the, uh, the uh, uh, group that runs the major commodity uh, exchanges in the United States, you find they have something called their central bank incentive programs which gives volume trading discounts to any government or central bank uh, that wants to uh, trade futures contracts in the United States, as long as they, uh, they trade through a uh, exchange approved uh, broker and all this trading is, is surreptitious. All this manipulation conducted through intermediaries is perfectly provided for and is perfectly legal. When Gata and Congressman Mooney uh, asked the Commodity Futures Trading Commission uh, does the commission have jurisdiction over manipulative trading in the futures markets that's undertaken by or at the behest of uh, the U.S. government? The commission repeatedly refuses to answer that question. Well, then you know what the answer is. No, the commission does not have jurisdiction over manipulation of the futures market undertaken by or at the behest of the U.S. government when it's undertaken through intermediaries. The, the bullion banks are just running government trades. Oh, nicely put there. And glad you kept your composure there as well, Chris. <laughs> well, we think um, we have free markets. No, we, we no. preach free markets to the world. Our, our markets are the, the most rigged markets in the world. Um, we, we got another comment under our last video we did, and the, the question is, maybe it's a bit of an exaggeration, but I'm curious how far we can take those Basel III rules. It's, uh, and, the, and the question is, I'm, I'm quoting verbatim here, so when will the paper market go away according to Basel rules? Um, is there even the chance of that happening? Uh, and I'm pretty much, I'm guessing it's all about the unallocated ounces and un unallocated uh, derivatives. Docu well, uh, the, the Basel issues. III rules don't make the paper market go away. They, they essentially make it prohibitively expensive for the usual bullion banks to participate in the paper market by issuing more uh, gold claims and credits than they have real physical metal to, uh, to back, up, back them up with. Uh, that doesn't make the uh, paper market go away. It doesn't pre prevent uh, uh, any financial house from, from you know, issuing uh, gold loans or gold claims, but it... Uh, it, it does destroy the, the major mechanism of creating paper gold that uh, has been operating for, for decades. Uh, uh, if, uh, if I was a central bank wanting to uh, uh, continue to control, manipulate the, uh, the gold market, how would I do it? Uh, 
I'd have to think about that. But if I was part of the Federal Reserve of the U.S. Treasury Department, I'd have an easier time about it because they are authorized to create money to infinity. And with, uh, uh, you know, infinite money, I think you can... You, you could you could do just about anything. You could even make me look handsome. <laughs> <laughs> no, fantastic. There you go. <laughs> I, I love like we were a podcast. We we can make all kinds of jokes, and we 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 can do that. So, um, good good stuff. Like I was just I had one thought though. I was like, who's the most accurate, or what is the most accurate platform record uh, reporting gold holdings? Like if, if I was just looking at like World Gold Council, LBMA, just throwing out some names. So the, the World Gold Council gets its data from the International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund is the official keeper of the gold statistics. So they, they won't necessarily give them to me, uh, but uh, the World Gold Council gets them from the uh, from the IMF. And the World Gold Council puts them on, uh, on the uh, council's internet site, which is gold.org. Um, those are the official statistics. Uh, however, we we also know that the official statistics are uh, are bogus because we uh, uh, we have a, a, a secret IMF report from some years ago that uh, acknowledged that the IMF allows central banks reporting their gold reserves uh, to the IMF to report golds that is out on loan just the same as if it's gold in the vault. Uh, so the IMF, we, we know this from the uh, secret IMF report we have on our uh, internet site, the report of the staff to the board of the IMF, uh, that the official figures of, uh, of gold reserves are, uh, are, are tainted, they're contaminated. They do not uh, account for gold that is out on loan. Uh, so the IMF figures are really being used to to conceal rather than to disclose. Chris, I just saw that, uh, let me get me back on the screen here. Sorry, I just got distracted looking at uh, IMF gold holdings. Um, I, I just saw that the IMF holds gold itself. I was not aware of that. Like, wh what does that mean? Did, wh what's the impact of that and why do they well, own gold? Every, every nation, as I recall, when the IMF was founded decades ago, was required to contribute some gold to the IMF. Now, at various points through the last few decades, I think since the 1970s, the IMF occasionally has sold gold. Uh, I think uh, the last notable sale of gold by the IMF uh, a couple of years ago, or maybe three years ago, uh, India bought a lot of it. I think it was like 200 tons. Uh, now, I'm sure the IMF still has uh, some gold, at least uh, uh, nominally on its books. I, I don't know how much. Uh, the Bank for International Settlements uh, claims to hold, I think, a little more than 100 tons of, of, of gold. Um, what are they doing with it? Uh, I went through a long correspondence with uh, uh, an IMF uh, official, Connie Latze, uh, years ago, trying to find out exactly uh, where the IMF's gold was and in what form it was. Uh, all the IMF would tell me was that uh, its rules uh, establish a few official depositories for IMF gold. I think one of them was in India at the time, but they wouldn't tell me how much uh, was at each uh, depository. And uh, when I kept pressing questions, they simply stopped uh, responding to me. Now, interesting. Apparently, like there's 90.5 million ounces uh, or that the IMF holds. And according to August 2022 exchange rates, that's like 4.1 billion US dollars. But then again, that's August 2022. So it does look like those numbers have been renewed uh, at market prices. Of, oh, sorry, that was based on historical cost. At market prices, their value is $155 billion. Mm -hmm. It's a massive amount of money. Yeah, or but, value. Where, but where it is, whether uh, it has uh, been compromised by swaps or loans, you know, I try asking that question. You know, if we could ever get the mainstream financial news organizations to put some questions like these critical gold questions to governments, central banks, the IMF, the BIS, uh, the, the gold business would, would blow up in, in a week. Uh, you know, we've done that with the BIS and BIS very, very quickly and politely responded, oh, we don't answer questions like those. Uh, you know, we have our consultant, Bob Lamborn, doing, you know, pretty uh, complicated uh, calculations uh, every month on the BIF statement of account because the BIF statement doesn't say plainly how many gold swaps they're carrying on their books. You have to do some addition, subtraction, and, 
uh, and, and, and division to calculate it, though the data is in the, the IMF or the BIS statement of the count. I mean, they, the, the BIS very easily could do this calculation, have an, an extra line on their statement of account saying, you know, how, how many gold swaps did we have in uh, this month and how many did we have last month and what was the change, but they don't do it. Why? Because it would highlight the intervention in the gold buy market by its member central banks. So, so Bob Lamborn uh, has to get this l limited uh, uh, monthly financial report that the BIS puts out and does the uh, uh, financial calculations. Uh, we have asked the BIS uh, a couple of times, uh, are, are Bob's calculations correct? They won't answer. Now, <laughs> if, if he was wrong, would they say that he was wrong? I don't know. But I, it's just one more thing that they're hiding. And, you know, when you find official uh, organizations hiding so much obvious stuff about gold, uh, I think you fairly can conclude that there are things going on here that governments and central banks don't want you to know about. And what they don't want you to know about is their intervention, their surreptitious intervention in the currency and related markets. Uh, and, uh, you know, the greatest power of central banking in the world is, is not the, the, their power to dispose infinite money. It's their power over the financial press. Uh, the financial press will not tell the truth about the most important issue in world finance. Interesting. Very interesting. And, and, and to digest as well. Like, yeah, I have one last question, Chris, and I'm not sure where to put it in first. That's a bit uh, jump, jumping around a little bit. So I do apologize for that. But I was thinking about the arbitrage between East and West, uh, West um, especially on the silver price right now. But uh, there, there's like a $4 markup in the East versus the West, for example. Do you see that arbitrage disappearing at all or increasing? Well, if if it, <laughs> if it disappears, it's probably because we're we're entering a new day of of free monetary metals markets. Uh, I'm sure the uh, arbitrageability of the silver price uh, will uh, will continue until you know, there truly are free markets uh, in the monetary metals. Uh, but uh, the uh, arbitrageability, I think, is another sign that uh, there's. Uh, high demand in one place and there's either low demand or there's suppression, price suppression in, uh, in, a, in another place. Uh, it's certainly uh, something that bears looking into, but the mainstream financial news organizations won't do it. Yeah. No, fantastic. Chris, I know you put out regular dispatches as well. Um, where can we find more of your work, Chris? Oh, well, uh, God's internet site is gata.org. Uh, we have a documentation section of, at that site uh, where uh, we just collect and compile all the, the proofs of intervention, all the documents, uh, admissions by central bankers. Uh, uh, we have a section called the basics where we have a pretty comprehensive summary of Western gold price uh, suppression policy. And then uh, every day we try to put out uh, two or three dispatches that we think might be of interest to people who are interested in uh, in, in the monetary metals markets and uh, efforts to control metals prices. Those uh, dispatches are, are free. Um, people uh, can go to the right column at the, the GATA internet site and, and uh, subscribe to our dispatches. And, you know, we're, we're glad to send them out to, uh, to people. And uh, we're a, uh, a nonprofit uh, 501c3 tax exempt uh, charitable and educational organization in the United States. Uh, uh, recognized as tax exempt by the Internal Revenue Service, and we survive on uh, on donations from people who were uh, not afraid of getting on a, a government blacklist somewhere. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Awesome. Chris, that was that was very insightful. I always appreciate having you on and uh, ch chatting. Usually we do it in person in New Orleans, so I figured we'd break the cycle, do it virtually once in a while here as well. Uh, Chris, tremendously appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, looking forward to catching up with you very soon. And to everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation here with Chris Powell from GATA. That's the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. Really insightful, very, very interesting to look at, you know, lift, lift the skirt a little bit. What is happening in the background of the gold market? How does it actually work? Uh, what is the Bank of International Settlement? How do swaps work? And uh, how, how the central banks are playing with the gold price? Really interesting discussion. If you, found, if, you, if, you, if you liked the discussion, leave a comment, leave a like, and of course, subscribe to the channel. I mentioned it earlier. 75 to 80 percent of you watching are not subscribed it would help us out tremendously be a huge favor to us help us help us increase our audience 
Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. We'll be back with lots more here on Soar Financially.